It seems like the world's gone crazy, doesn't it? People are fighting, and probably most of you who've seen videos like that know what they're fighting over. They're fighting over toilet paper. Who fights over toilet paper? And yet our world seems to have gone crazy. Why is it that our entire world seems to have gone so completely crazy? Well, there is a very interesting study that I would have loved to be a part of. It was set up in England. If you were part of the study, you would go into a room, uh, Chris and or Doug and or John, make sure you can see my screen. Hopefully that's a older text message. Um, I think you can see my screen now. On the screen, you should see a picture of a diagram of how the study went down. You would sit in front of a computer screen and you would be presented with a picture on the screen of a rock. You would have about one second to decide whether or not there was a snake underneath that rock. Then the rock would be turned over, and if there was a snake, some electrodes on your hand would deliver a small shock, not enough to be dangerous, but very unpleasant, representing that you just got bitten by the snake as you were turning over the rock. Of course, if you guessed correctly and there was no snake, you didn't get shocked. Now, what the researchers were looking for was the human stress response. First off, they offered the folks money if they made correct predictions to incentivize them to make correct predictions. And then they gave them some information to help them predict whether or not there would be a snake under the rock. For example, rocks that are smoother are more likely to have snakes. Only about 25% of the rocks have snakes. Larger rocks are more likely to have snakes. Rocks in the sun are more likely to have snakes and other things such as this. As the experiment progressed, however, they varied the accuracy of the predictions that individuals were able to make based on the information they were given. In other words, they would give them information such as larger rocks are more likely to have snakes, but then it would turn out that the small rocks had snakes too. And what they discovered is that humans, that drives them crazy. Humans want to be able to control their environment and control their risk. And decreasing ability to control their environment and predict risk at least drove these humans crazy. Their cortisol levels went up, their pupils dilated, and there were various other stress markers. Here's what the researchers said. Here, we reveal a strong relationship between stress and subjective estimates of irreducible uncertainty. Let me put that into plain language. Things that drive high stress levels in life are greater risk, greater inability to decrease your risk, greater uncertainty, greater inability to decrease your uncertainty through knowledge. In other words, you know you don't know, and there's nothing you can do about it. That drives humans crazy. So I think you can see how the current situation with a very serious threat facing our world, we'll discover how serious momentarily, inability to really gauge how much stress affects me personally or my family or my community and contradictory information that's just pouring at me from all directions, 24 seven media coverage. All of this increases human stress levels to the extent that humans fight for toilet paper. If I can't control my risk of getting a virus, at least I can control my ability to clean my bottom. Humans need to control their environment and if they can't, they look for something else that they can control to compensate for it. So what can we at Dinner with the Doctor do? Well, hopefully we can decrease your risk and we're going to look at that very specifically tonight. Hopefully increasing your knowledge can help you with decreased stress levels. We can give you some hints to manage stress. And of course we want to provide a community such that each one of us feels part of a, a larger community. Uh, Pastor Chris, if you're available, I don't know if you're available, I can't see a screen, but if you are available, if you don't mind having an opening prayer as we always do at Dinner with the Doctor, uh, I would appreciate that if you're available um, to have an opening prayer now.
Okay. Yeah, I'm unmuted. All right. Certainly. Let's have prayer. Father in heaven, we live in uncertain times, but we believe in a certain God. We know that you're with us and we need not fear. I pray that as we um, had this message this evening, this topic that Dr. Nelson is sharing with us, that you would help us to have peace with you and help us to increase our knowledge and help us to decrease our risk and help us to do whatever it takes to place our life in your hands. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's start with some background on the virus. We're going to talk a little bit about the virus, how we got to where we are, uh, how much we should be worried, and then we're going to talk about what we can do about it. COVID-19 uh, is part of it, or is the disease name for the disease caused by the uh, new virus that comes from the family of coronaviruses. Now there's four coronaviruses that are very widely distributed. They cause the common cold. All of us have some experience with that. Uh, the severe acute respiratory syndrome and the Middle East respiratory syndrome were related coronavirus. It turns out that SARS or severe acute respiratory syndrome uh, which also originated in China, is the most closely related virus to the current outbreak. Like the uh, COVID-19 uh, causing virus, SARS also binds to the angiotensin converting enzyme receptor. And this receptor is located on the alveolar cells that line your, the air sacs within your lungs, and interestingly, also on intestinal, your gut lining. Now, it is definitely true that the virus is mutating. On the screen, you see a picture of the two main serovars. They've colored them two different colors. And within each one of those, they have checked the genetic sequence of the virus. And as the virus travels through different countries, it slightly changes. And so it might be true that some of the facts that some countries are being hit worse than others has to do with the fact that the virus in those different countries is a little bit uh, different. Um, how is this virus transmitted? The main mechanism of transmission is large droplet transmission. You see a picture of someone coughing there on the top right of your screen. This risk is limited to about six feet. Now it's controversial whether COVID-19 can be transmitted via an airborne route. This, of course, would require more distance than six feet if indeed the aerosolized virus is surviving in the air. There is one study that demonstrates it can persist in the air as an aerosol for several hours, but this does not necessarily mean that it can be transmitted to someone else after several hours. That study doesn't say anything about how much of a dose of the virus would then cause illness in someone else. It didn't demonstrate that. So the main mechanism of transmission is large droplet transmission, but almost as important is contact transmission or fomite. A fomite is, for instance, if you cough on your hand and then you touch the door handle and then someone else comes through and touches the door handle and then wipes their face. That has then transferred the virus from your cough to the door handle to their hand and then to their face. This uh, mechanism of transmission has a, a tendency to be perhaps overlooked sometimes, but it is probably incredibly important. You've probably seen the studies demonstrating how long the virus can survive on a variety of different surfaces. Certain surfaces, it can certainly survive for even several days, whereas others, it doesn't survive quite as long. What about the timing of transmission? It turns out that some individuals at least it does seem can transmit the virus to other people even before they show symptoms. And this is what is somewhat scary about this particular virus. You may be infected but not know it and therefore be transferring the virus to someone else. This may be you have not developed symptoms yet, you are in the pre-symptomatic period, or you may be one of those lucky individuals that really doesn't have very severe symptoms from the virus but nevertheless, you can still share it with others around you. Although this is fairly scary, it turns out it's likely not the main mechanism of transmission. It seems that very few individuals are actively shedding large amounts of the virus and transmitting it to others when they are not symptomatic. It can happen, but it's probably not the main mechanism of transfer for this particular virus. 
estimates for how long someone can be asymptomatic and still transferring the virus. Um, some individuals can be asymptomatic after exposure for up to three weeks, although most folks, as we'll see, develop symptoms between two and seven days. As far as asymptomatic transmission, up to seven days is postulated, again, in certain cases, but this is not every single case. Um, for instance, I saw on Facebook a meme suggesting that you might develop the virus and might give it to 10 people before you even know that you have symptoms three weeks later. That's not accurate. It doesn't happen that way. It might be that some individuals can do this, but it's not common. More common is after you do have some symptoms, as we'll see, the symptoms can be fairly vague. You may still, for whatever reason, be in your family or visiting friends or doing other things you probably shouldn't do, and you can transfer the virus while you have symptoms. A big question is how long after you have gotten through all of your symptoms, are you still able to transmit the virus to others? It is true, and this again, you've probably seen this on Facebook or other social media, it is true that after you have recovered from the viral infection, you can still be positive on a test for the virus. But it seems that this is fairly rare to transmit the virus because your viral load has gotten so small that even though the virus can be detected on what we call PCR tests, it's very unlikely that you personally are sharing it with others after you have recovered. But just to be safe, you probably want to give it an extra several days. But um, I heard one employer was requiring people to, after they've recovered, be out for an additional month. That's not required. A few days is fine. So how can we prevent transmission? We've discovered how it is transmitted. Well, the obvious thing is cleaning regularly. Hand hygiene, you already know, is incredibly important. And avoid touching your face. That's easy to say, but very hard to do. Most of us touch our faces probably 20, 30, 40 times per hour. It's not possible, as we'll see in some of our videos, to completely avoid that. So wash your hands, use hand sanitizer with at least 70% alcohol. We have a video to look at next, so hopefully the sound will be adequate here for you. You know that the best way to prevent the spread of coronavirus is to wash your hands. Wash your hands, Wash your hands! But why? It's because soap, regular soap, fancy honeysuckle soap, artisan peppermint soap, just any soap absolutely annihilates viruses like the coronavirus. Here's how. This is what a virus like coronavirus looks like. It's a bit of material surrounded by a coating of proteins and fat. Viruses easily stick to places like your hands, but when you rinse your hands with just water, it rushes right over the virus. That's because that layer of fat makes the virus behave kind of like a drop of oil. You can see it happening in this demonstration. Oils are just liquid fats. What happens when you pour oil into water? It floats. It doesn't mix. But add soap. And suddenly that fatty oil dissolves into the water. That's because inside, soap has two-sided molecules. One end of the molecule is attracted to water, the other end to fat. So when the soap molecules come in contact with water and fat, these dual attractions literally pull the fat apart, surrounding the oil particles and dispersing them through the water. Let's go back to our coronavirus molecule with that layer of fat holding everything together. When it interacts with soap, bam, that fat gets pulled out by the soap. Soap literally pulls apart and demolishes these viruses. And then the water rinses the harmless leftover shards of virus down the drain. But, and you know where I'm going with this, it takes time for this effect to happen. 20 seconds to be specific. To show why, we ordered this lotion that mimics viruses in their fatty layers. It glows under a UV light. If you just rinse your hands under regular water, nothing comes off. If you wash with soap for just 5 seconds or 10 seconds, your hands are still covered. The virus is still there, able to get you and others sick. But 20 full seconds, now the soap is actually destroying the virus. 
Hand sanitizer works too because it's mostly alcohol, and alcohol works in a somewhat similar way to soap, breaking down that fatty layer. You need a high concentration of alcohol to make that work. The CDC recommends hand sanitizers with at least 60% alcohol. But even with 60% alcohol, the CDC recommends using soap if you can. If your hands are sweaty or dirty when you use the sanitizer, that can dilute it and diminish its effectiveness. As for soap, just any old soap works. You don't need soap marketed as antibacterial even. The FDA says skip it. There's no proof it's any more effective. Just be sure to wash your hands for 20 seconds. That's happy birthday twice. Happy birthday, dear. So hopefully all of you are singing happy birthday. They go through a whole bunch of other songs that you can sing, but I think we'll uh, skip them for sake of time. An important concept you need to understand about the coronavirus and COVID-19 is R not. You see the symbol on your screen there, R not. This is the number of people that each person who has the disease infects. And it's a very important concept to understand in epidemiology and to understand why the virus spreads the way it does. So current estimates put r naught for COVID-19 somewhere between 2.5 and 2.9. That's about the same or a little bit worse than the seasonal influenza, that, the flu that comes through every year. The reason this is somewhat variable is that r naught is a reflection both of the virus virulence itself, but also human behavior. Social distancing, improved hygiene will reduce R naught. On the other hand, crowded conditions, shared accommodations are going to increase R naught significantly. For example, you all know about the Diamond Princess cruise ship. This cruise ship had a bunch of people on it that were crowded together, and many of them developed the coronavirus infection. The R naught reflecting the number of people that were infected on that cruise ship was 15, showing that cramped quarters and inadequate hygiene can drastically increase the rate at which this infection spreads. Here's something that is more worrisome to me than a lot of what I see flying around the internet. On the screen, you see the different symptoms at the time of presentation in a variety of studies that have been done on the coronavirus infection this year. The largest cohort you see in the left-hand column is the New England Journal of Medicine article that had 1,081 patients. They asked all of these patients, when you first started to have symptoms and they figured out when they developed coronavirus, what were those symptoms? If you visit any hospital in town or other facility that's putting restrictions on you being there because of coronavirus, you'll see they're asking about fevers and a cough in general, perhaps other upper, upper respiratory symptoms. But if you look at the slide on the screen in front of you, you'll see that only 68% of people complained of a cough when they first developed coronavirus. That's only a little more than half. And if you look on the top line at fever, only 43% percent of people in that large cohort had a fever. In some of the other studies, of course, it was much higher, but they were looking at critically ill patients. So if you look at a large group of patients, many patients have fairly vague symptoms. They may have a little bit of excess sputum. They may have some nausea or diarrhea. They may just have a headache. People present with coronavirus in different manners and this vagueness of symptomatology means that many patients may not know that they actually have the disease. Here's how we diagnose coronavirus. Uh, most of us don't think about how far back our nasal passage goes, but that mock-up on the screen uh, gives us an idea of how far back a nasal swab can actually get. Reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction looks for the RNA that is contained within the coronavirus. This test has a very high specificity. That means that if a test comes back positive, you almost certainly do have a coronavirus infection. However, a negative test result doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have it. If you have a very suggestive chest X-ray or chest CT or symptoms that are very classic and a known exposure, you might need to get tested a second time 
and very commonly the second test will come back positive. How does the disease run its course? Well, as we mentioned previously, most patients have an asymptomatic period before they know that they have the disease. They'll have an exposure that will figure out who it was that gave it to them, and anywhere from two to 14 days, usually about four or five days after that exposure, they have no idea that they already are infected with coronavirus. When they do develop symptoms, those symptoms last a variable amount of time, but usually about eight days in the vast majority of cases. For those individuals who actually do develop severe disease, they will start to get short of breath about six days after exposure. Usually they'll get admitted to the hospital about eight days, and then they'll be transferred to the ICU about day 10. And then of course, the question is, are they going to live or die? And most people are going to live, but they'll be in the ICU for several days recovering, and then perhaps a few more days in the hospital on oxygen. I'll start talking about treatment a little bit. I took this from a website uh, called emcrit.org, uh, and you see it on the bottom right-hand corner there. This was a good website. Uh, it's a shared knowledge base for emergency medicine physicians and critical care uh, physicians. And it says, we know how to treat severe viral pneumonia and ARDS. We've been doing this for many years. And currently there's no evidence that treating COVID-19 is any different than treating these other forms of viral pneumonia, such as the flu. As you know, there's no vaccine yet. There are some early trials going on and the vaccine might be available later this year, more likely next year. There are no medications yet proven. All we do is supportive care, oxygen. If a patient cannot maintain their oxygenation, they'll need a breathing tube. And there's some very specific ventilator strategies to maximize someone's survival if they are developing a severe form of COVID-19. I wanna emphasize that there are no medications yet proven. You've probably seen flying all over social media, the idea that uh, hydroxychloroquine is the, it, maybe with azithromycin is going to solve all of the world's problems. Remdesivir, these are all under investigation. And there's a study that's making the rounds on Facebook. I've seen it cited at least five or six times that says these medications are going to cure COVID-19. Every time I see it, I make a comment to the person who shared it saying, actually read the study. It turns out it's not quite as impressive as you might think based on the comments about it. Uh, this is what the CDC says about it. One small study reported that hydroxychloroquine alone or in combination with azithromycin reduced detection of COVID-19 RNA in upper respiratory tract specimens compared with a non-randomized control group but did not assess clinical benefit. In other words, if my recollection serves me correctly, I think it was either six or eight days after starting this combination of medications, they again swabbed the patient's nostrils and demonstrated fewer viral particles in the group that was being treated with medication. However, they didn't even try to measure any clinical benefit. And in fact, it was at least three and maybe four of the patients in that treatment group that required transfer to the ICU and several patients dropped out. So we don't know what became of them. So this is very early. There are additional studies ongoing, but no medications are yet proven. There are some risk factors I'm sure you know. Older age is one of the big ones. If you are over age 70, you are at a significantly increased risk for having severe complications from the COVID-19 virus. You've all seen the graphs. Those who are in the oldest age group are the most likely to die from this, similar to any other uh, flu um, uh, pneumonia that might develop. Other risk factors include coronary artery disease, hypertension, diabetes, of course, chronic pulmonary diseases like COPD or emphysema. All of these are going to put someone in a high-risk category for having complications and perhaps even dying from uh, this particular viral infection. So what you have, based on what we've talked about so far, is a recipe for a pandemic. You have, at least in some cases, the ability to transmit the virus to others before an individual knows they have it. You have symptomatology that's fairly vague, such that some individuals may never know that they actually had this. They may think they had some other diagnosis, and so they're not quarantining themselves. There are at least a very few asymptomatic carriers, that is individuals who just never know that they have it, but they're continually shedding the virus. 
you have a slightly higher R0 value, which we'll look at in just a moment compared to some other infections. That is, one individual gives it to about 2.5 to 2.9 other individuals. And you have a slightly higher mortality rate from this compared to influenza. We don't know exactly what that number is. Um, you see many numbers thrown around on the internet. Some are essentially scare tactics. It turns out there's two different ways to measure mortality, one of which likely overestimates mortality and the other which likely underestimates mortality. So you need to put all of that data together. Here we have a graph of many different infectious diseases so that you can kind of get an idea where COVID-19 fits into a variety of other um, diseases. I think you can see my mouse, I hope. Infectious diseases run a gamut. On the y-axis, you have um, the deadliness or the case fatality rate. What percentage of people who get this disease actually die from this disease? So at the very top, untreated rabies has a mortality rate of essentially 100%. Untreated HIV, 80%, Ebola, 70%. Of course, there's a couple different strains of Ebola. Tuberculosis is very high, about 65, 70% as well. These are very, very dangerous, deadly diseases. On the x-axis, and here on the bottom, you have the infectiousness of a disease. That is, on average, what is the r naught value? How many individuals does one infected individual end up um, causing to have symptoms. So all the way out here on the right, you have things like rotavirus or a stomach virus and measles, whooping cough, malaria, mumps. These are diseases that are extremely infectious. I think measles, one person gives it to about 16 or 17 people uh, in an unvaccinated uh, setting. It's very, very infectious. So here we have a red box. I put it about where we think uh, COVID-19 sits. COVID-19 has a mortality rate that is definitely higher than the flu. Uh, influenza has a mortality rate probably about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 on average, depending on the population that you're looking at. Um, and so a lot of people die every year from the flu, but we don't think about it. We've kind of gotten used to it. COVID-19 has a mortality rate that is probably at least 10 times that it's probably about 1% or a little bit higher. The best data that I can figure out is the Diamond Princess cruise ship. There were about 700 people that got infected on that cruise ship and seven of them died. This is a fairly elderly population. So many of, um, many of them you would expect to have very serious consequences from the COVID-19 disease. And yet with medical care, the mortality rate was only 1%. Contrast that with Italy, however, if the virus gets to the point where adequate, good medical care in an intensive care unit is not available to those who need it, now you see those kind of scary mortality numbers that you see on Facebook every day coming out of Italy, where the mortality rate is you know, much higher than that, even perhaps up to 10%. Well, those are scary numbers, but we have to put them in context. Probably the mortality rate is not going to be that high for all comers. And again, we have the question of what's the denominator, how many people are being tested. So I think that box is a fair estimate. It goes from 2.5 to about three on the R naught, that's your X axis. And as far as mortality rate, uh, it goes from probably about 1%, perhaps a little bit more. A lot of that, again, depends on how well the medical system can cope with this pandemic, which we'll talk about in a moment. So what's the solution? The solution, as you've all seen, is to flatten the curve. I appreciate uh, Doug Pratt. Uh, behind the scenes, we have Doug Pratt, we have Chris Anderson, and we have uh, John Lucas. And I appreciate Brandon as well. Brandon's been working on fixing the website. Uh, again, apologize for the uh, problems we had getting started, but he helped us get started. And yesterday, um, Doug helped me get these famous uh, Washington Post graphics simulating how the coronavirus could spread in two different scenarios. They actually had four or five different scenarios on, on that uh, link there, but I just uh, pulled two of them here for your viewing pleasure. Here's the first one. In this particular simulation, society continues on as normal. One person is running into lots and lots of other people in random ways. 
And as you see, essentially the entire population contracts coronavirus and then some of them start to get better. This particular simulation does not show the people who died. That is, um, again, something these simulations don't show. The next simulation shows what happens with extreme social distancing. I'll take a picture or take a look at that here now. This is extreme social distancing where many people are sheltering in place or they're not, they're not going out. Only few people are going out, those who have to. Um, and you can see the virus is spreading much more slowly. Many individuals are becoming immune to it before uh, they, or many individuals are getting over the virus and then they're not spreading it uh, anymore. And I think that's the end of that simulation there. So in this particular uh, simulation, you see only 29 uh, people actually are sick at the end of it. 134 people stayed healthy through the entire simulation and 37 got over the virus. So a very different simulation when many people are not moving around and interacting with so many other people. So what does the future hold? I have another video here. This is the same scientist that I showed some videos of in our January dinner with the doctor. So I hope you enjoy this. I want to talk about timeline for all of this. What's going to happen? Because the predictions we've been getting from our elected officials have been a little unreliable. When you have 15 people and the 15 within a couple of days is going to be down to close to zero, uh, that's a pretty good job we've done. That was February 26th. There were 60 cases in the U.S. by then, not 15, and it didn't go to zero. They went to 4,663 as of March 17. Where are the numbers going next, up or down? Let's take a look at the history of this thing. First case of coronavirus surfaced in China mid-November. By late December, Chinese doctors were trying to sound the alarm. Something unusual was going on. But as we all know, initially the authorities shut them down and tried to keep the whole thing under wraps. Wuhan went into lockdown on January 23, roughly a month after doctors tried to blow the whistle. By then, there were 830 cases. Now, the incubation period varies from a couple of days to all the way to 27 days for some outliers. So we're talking average a couple weeks, give or take. And in fact, the quarantine in most airports and borders is 14 days. So if the measures work, we should expect the number of new infections to start going down after about two weeks, roughly. This is new cases reported day by day in China. Here we are in January 23. Wuhan goes on lockdown, but new cases continue to pop up. That's expected, right? The virus was incubating in those people. Two weeks of lockdown puts us on February 6. After that, it does start to come down. A couple odd days, but in general, the trend is a clear down ramp. From 3,000 new cases a day at the peak to 40 cases a day recently. That's a massive drop. Okay, some people don't trust those numbers. Maybe they're not reporting them accurately. They want to look better for the international community. Who knows? In science, you always want to look at replication. So let's look at South Korea. In Korea, they never did a full lockdown. Instead, throughout February, there were massive campaigns of public education and containment. They were asking the population to work from home and they started rolling out their extensive testing. About a quarter million Koreans have now been tested for coronavirus. By early March, we see the number of new infections start to go down. They're seeing very small numbers now. Now, these are not like the experiments I'm used to doing in a lab where you control every little factor. There's a lot of variables here. We're looking at an entire country, but the trends suggest that these countries have turned the corner. Wait, maybe this is a normal course of the infection. Maybe the virus comes on for a couple weeks and then naturally dies off and goes away. Maybe all those measures have nothing to do with it. This is just a natural course. What we need is another example where things didn't go so textbook, Italy. After China, it's the country that's been hit the hardest. Let's look at Italy and Korea side by side. Unlike China, they have similar population size, 60 and 51 million. I replotted all the numbers day by day. Korea is orange. Coronavirus got there a little earlier. Not surprising, they're right next to China. Italy's about three days behind Korea. So Korea rose first, but by early March, Italy had caught up. Now remember, throughout February, Korea's clamping down hard. Social education, people are staying at home, getting tested. By early March, their numbers are going down. Italy keeps rising. Italy finally sets the nationwide quarantine on March 9. By then, they're averaging almost 2,000 new cases a day, twice what Korea was averaging at their peak. And Italian cases kept rising. They're currently averaging 3,500 new cases a day. That's the same China was averaging at their peak, with a much larger population, of course. Okay, the numbers kept rising even after Italy instituted the quarantine. 
Does that mean it's not working? No, it's expected. It's been about 10 days of quarantine now. So if it's like in Asia, this may start to round down sometime this week. Now, of course, there are many differences between the two countries, societal and otherwise. Italians are touchier. Italians may be more gregarious. They may go out more. That may all play a role. But the point here is that we have two countries of similar population size that got hit at around the same time and yet vastly different outcome. And I love Italy. It's one of my favorite countries in the world. And I love Italian people. And it really hurts me to see this. But all we can do is learn from it. France and Spain are also hurting. Both instituted a lockdown this week. Borders closed, still trending up. Entirely expected. Okay, what about the US? Clearly trending up. Now, the US government has started to change its attitude recently. New guidelines came out this week recommending closing schools and avoiding non-essential travel, not going to bars and restaurants, etc. So, all societal and geographical differences notwithstanding, if the virus behaves in the West as it did in the Far East, we're looking at a couple weeks until we pass that peak and the numbers start going down, and then probably another couple weeks till the numbers get really low. Things are gonna get worse before they get better. Also worth noting, we don't know what happens after the lockdowns get lifted and people go back to their normal lives. It's possible we'll see another little uptick, but even if we do, it'll probably be much, much smaller than what we're seeing now and we'll be much better prepared. So we have a model to follow. We can try to replicate the Korean case or the Italian. This is doable and we can make it happen, but it's gonna take laying low for a while. It's a drag, I get that, but it will keep the number of deaths in the at-risk group as low as possible. In the meantime, we're gonna figure out a lot about this virus and how to deal with it. These are the scientific studies on coronavirus. So he starts talking about some of the scientific studies there. Again, for sake of time, we'll, um, we'll move forward here. Um, we're gonna transition a little bit. I think we all understand a little bit about the virus here. I hope that the information that I've given you conveys that this is a serious situation and yet not all the information that you see on Facebook is entirely reliable. In fact, much of it is not. The 24 seven news cycle has definitely made all of us perhaps more stressed and more afraid, but this is a serious situation and we need to, uh, we need to listen to what the epidemiologists are uh, telling us. Let's focus on preventing the disease. I think that most people are eventually going to have a run-in with COVID-19. It may not be this year or even next year, but similar to the flu, I think all of us have experienced the flu at one point or another. This disease, if anything, is a little bit more infectious and certainly a little bit more serious, so likely most people eventually are going to catch it. The goal, of course, is to not let that happen, or if you do catch COVID-19, to reduce the severity of symptoms and the risk that you will have of being in the hospital, being in the ICU, and even dying. And this brings us to the idea of immune health. If you're exposed, what determines the severity of the disease for you? Let's talk basic immunology for just a moment. Your innate immune system is your first line of defense. You want to make sure that your skin is intact, your mucous membranes are intact, your chemical barriers such as the lysozyme in your tears, the acid in your stomach is intact, you want a normal gut flora. This competes with um, the bacteria that are trying to invade. It acts as a barrier as well. There's many other parts to your innate immune system, such as mast cells that cause inflammation, phagocytes, neutrophils, macrophages. Your acquired immune system um, consists of B cells and T cells that build a specific response that can be also remembered. So we've got a little video here to kind of explain I hope this is helpful to you. Um, this was a good review for me of things that I haven't thought about in a long time. Our body has a powerful army that protects it from various types of threats. These threats can come in the form of mechanical injuries, the entry of germs, or the entry of other foreign particles like dust. This personal army is called the immune system. Every day, we encounter a huge number of bacteria, viruses, and other disease-causing organisms. However, we don't fall ill every other day, which is due to our immune system, an army of cells that is always roaming our body, ready to ward off any attack. The immune system can be broadly divided into two parts, innate and adaptive immunity. Innate immunity, or nonspecific immunity, is the body's first natural defense to any intruder. 
This system doesn't care what it's killing. Its primary goal is to prevent any intruder from entering the body. And mm -hmm. if it does enter, then the immune system neutralizes this intruder. It doesn't differentiate between one pathogen and another. The first component of this defensive system is our skin. My apologies, I'm decreasing the volume for you slightly. Any organism trying to get into the body is stopped by the skin, our largest organ, which covers us. Secondly, there is the mucus lining of all our organs. The sticky, viscous fluid traps any pathogens trying to get past it. These are the two physical barriers. However, we also have chemical barriers, such as the lysozyme in the eyes, or the acid in the stomach, which can kill pathogens trying to gain entry. The genitourinary tract and other places have their own normal flora or microbial community. These compete with pathogens for space and food, and therefore also act as a barrier. The next line of defense is inflammation, which is done by mast cells. These cells are constantly searching for suspicious objects in the body. When they find something, they release a signal in the form of histamine molecules. These alert the body, and blood is rushed to the problem area. This causes inflammation and also brings leukocytes, or white blood cells, which are soldiers in our body's cellular army. Once they come, all hell breaks loose. Sometimes, however, the intruder may not be a germ, but rather a harmless thing like a dust particle. The body still causes a full immune reaction to this intruder, which is how allergic reactions occur. In the fortress of our body, the leukocytes are VIPs. They have an all-access pass to the body, except, of course, to the brain and spinal cord. Our leukocytes come in many types. Those that belong to the innate system are the phagocytes. These cells can either patrol your body, like the neutrophils, or they can stay in certain places and wait for their cue. Neutrophils are the most abundant cells. They patrol the body and can therefore get to a breach site very quickly. These cellular soldiers kill the infectious cell and then die, which leads to the formation of pus. There are also the big bad wolves, or the macrophages. These cells are like hungry, ravenous monsters who simply engulf unwanted pathogens. Instead of roaming freely in our blood, they are collected in certain places. These cells can consume about 100 pathogens before they die, but they can also detect our own cells that have gone rogue, such as cancer cells, and kill them too. Beyond that, we also have the natural killer cells. These cells can efficiently detect when our own cells have gone rogue or are infected with, say, a virus. NKCs detect a protein produced by normal cells called the major histocompatibility complex, or MHC. Basically, whenever a cell isn't normal, it stops producing this protein. The NKCs move around constantly, checking our cells for this type of deficiency. And when they find an abnormal cell, they simply bind to it, release chemicals, and destroy it. The last cells of our innate immune system are the dendritic cells. These are found in places that come in contact with the outside environment such as the nose and lungs. They are the link between our innate and adaptive immune systems. They eat a pathogen and then carry information about it to our adaptive immune system cells. This information is produced and shared in the form of antigens. Antigens are the traces that pathogens leave behind. They are molecules found on the surface of pathogens that can be detected by our adaptive immune system for recognition. The dendritic cells pass on this information to our T cells. However, macrophages can also perform this function. Now, there is also the adaptive or acquired immune system. This system is more efficient as it can differentiate between different types of pathogens. It has two main components, T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. T cells come into play when an infection has already occurred, thus bringing about the cell-mediated immune response. B cells join the fight when the pathogens have entered, but haven't yet caused any disease. This is called the humoral immune response. Some T cells take signals from the dendritic cells or macrophages and are thus called helper T cells. They perform two key tasks, forming effector T cells, which are basically cells that cycle through the body and call in the cavalry, namely other white blood cells. Helper T cells also form memory T cells, which keep a record of this antigen for future reference. 
Sometimes, some cells of our body know that they have lost the battle. They have become heavily infected with pathogens, so there is no hope left for them. At this point, the immune system brings out the cytotoxic T cells. These cells rush over and perform a mercy killing for the infected and dying cell. Furthermore, we have the B cells. They produce chemicals called antibodies, which fit on the antigens of pathogens, much like how a lock and key fit together. These antibodies crowd around a pathogen and act like tags. They signal the macrophages to come and kill the marked pathogen. B cells also produce memory B cells when they encounter an antigen. The B and T memory cells jointly maintain a record of all encountered infections and thus strengthen and solidify the body's immune response to these infections in the future. Our innate response is quicker, though nonspecific. It gets into action within hours and is pretty strong. However, when things get out of hand, the innate system calls for help from the acquired immune system. This system can take days to mount a response, but the next time we encounter that pathogen, it won't make us get sick. In short, every day that we spend being healthy is all thanks to our immune system, so it definitely deserves our respect. So we definitely want a strong immune system. Let's talk about some things that we can do to make sure that each one of us do have a strong immune system. Uh, you see the ones, the, the things we're going to go through on the screen. We talk a lot about nutrition at dinner with the doctor. Talk a lot about exercise. Talk about water, sleep. There's some um, uh, obvious. Um, there's some obvious bad things that we want to avoid. We're going to talk about how to de-stress and some ways to do that. And then again, we've got to talk about supplements because a lot of people talk about supplements. So we'll finish up looking at that and how to evaluate the information. There's two studies here that I pulled some quotes from that I think are very, very interesting. It is okay as lots of, there's lots of other videos out there by individuals similar to myself that have a deep concern for uh, folks' immune health, folks to eat a plant-based diet and all the reasons behind that. And it's okay to focus on specific nutrients. There's lots of other videos that talk about plants that have enough zinc and vitamin C and all the B vitamins and A and fiber and iron and whatever else. There's all sorts of other videos that cover those sorts of things. But as you see on the screen, that doesn't explain the benefits to your immune health that plants have. It turns out that there are thousands of phytochemicals in different types of plants, especially colorful plants, that prime your immune response. Some studies have shown that these immune cells have a greater ability to proliferate after people consume plant compounds. These prime the cells and it may help to reduce chronic inflammation, thus supporting dual roles for the uh, T cells. There's a second review there. That's the second citation you see. This review suggests that higher intakes of fruits and vegetables lead to both reduction in pro-inflammatory mediators and an enhanced immune cell profile. There's lots of studies about plant-based diet demonstrating that it strengthens your immune system and allows it to react more quickly and more powerfully to any uh, invaders that are trying to take you down. So a plant-based diet is the most important thing. I don't really care exactly what you eat as far as the plants go. Sure, there's some plants that have lots of zinc in them and that's fine, eat those too. But also eat the things that have lots of vitamin C. Eat lots of fresh fruits and vegetables, especially colorful fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables and your immune health will be optimized. Don't worry about the individual minerals or vitamins. There's lots of phytochemicals, literally thousands of them that support your immune health and you don't get those in pill form. Exercise is extremely important, especially as individuals age. You recall that elderly folks are at the most risk from COVID-19. Severe exercise is not what you want to be doing right now. Don't train for a marathon. Don't take up any extreme weightlifting. Don't do an Ironman right now. Severe exercise actually depresses your immune system. What you want to do is continue, hopefully you all have already started, continue mild to moderate exercise every single day. This is very beneficial for your immune health, especially in the elderly whose immune health is already naturally decreasing. Exercise helps ameliorate that decrease. Why? We don't know for sure. These are four theories that were put forth in the Clinical Journal of Sports Medicine. I don't know that any of them are more accurate than any others, but physical activity, 
may help you expel bacteria from your lungs and airways because you do have to uh, breathe more, more heavily perhaps. Um, perhaps it helps better circulation for your antibodies and your white blood cell count, thus uh, preventing infections. Of course, exercise does raise your body temperature and we all know that raising a body temperature is part of your body's response and that can help fight infections better. And of course, exercise is a great way to deal with stress and decreasing stress also protects against illness. Where should you exercise? Well, the picture I had on that previous slide showed a bunch of people indoors, but outdoors is much better for at least two reasons. Fresh air is incredibly important. You all know the feeling of being cooped up in a small room with lots of other people. The air just gets stale after a time. And that does, isn't just a function of the body odor of the other people in the room. Negative air ions are an incredibly important way to measure the freshness of air. I don't think it's the whole story, but indoors you have much fewer negative air ions. The best place to exercise is out of doors with the fresh air, a lot of deep breathing. There are lots of negative air ions that have some health giving effects or are at least associated with health giving effects. I will say don't try to get by with getting a negative air ion generator for indoors, it doesn't necessarily work. All those Himalayan salt lamps, they actually don't produce any negative air ions despite the hype. There's no substitute for getting out of doors. The best place, if you're really trying to get a lot of negative air ions, are at the base of waterfalls and at the seashore. The uh, shearing forces of water are, uh, cause a lot of negative air ions by the Leonard effect. He won the Nobel Prize in 1905. It's a very interesting uh, thing to look into. So lots of fresh air is very healthy for us. And of course, sunshine. We talked about sunshine in our uh, dermatology lecture at Dinner with the Doctor. Dr. Chung went into this in great detail. Dr. Inancourt at uh, one of the diabetes programs, I think last year, shared a study that demonstrated that getting vitamin D from sunshine is superior to getting it in pill form. So if any way possible, get outdoors for fresh air, for sunshine. I'm looking out the window right now and there's not much sunshine today, but at least you can get the fresh air. The UV rays will come through uh, the clouds and you can still get some vitamin D even on cloudy days. What about water? Now, everybody knows that your body's mostly water. You definitely need to make sure you hydrate. Drink your eight glasses a day, but don't tie drinking every 15 minutes. Uh, in those hospitalized for coronavirus infections, actually fluid restriction is sometimes practiced because the lungs tend to fill up with water. And so if they're developing that uh, ARDS response, acute respiratory distress syndrome, actually you don't want to be overly hydrated. So don't push your water intake beyond what's normal. Turns out there's some external uses of, shower, of uh, water as well that I wanna just mention here. Interesting data from the Spanish flu back in 1918. Uh, there were lots of sanitariums that were uh, functioning back at that time, and they treated the individuals who came down with the Spanish flu with a lot of fomentations. Now, I was not taught how to do fomentations in medical school, but I've talked with a lot of older doctors who were, and this is still found in older medical textbooks. You see a picture at the bottom of the screen there. It's simply a way to apply moist heat to different areas of the body, and typically it'll be alternated with, um, with cold as well. Uh, an easy way to do that is a contrast shower. In the uh, top right-hand corner, you've probably seen this on Facebook. I don't have any data proving that it works, but certainly cycling through hot and cold water, more hot than cold, uh, is a good thing to do. I've done this for years just because it's a great way to wake up. One thing that does have a lot of data is the sauna. Over in Finland, you know, they use saunas a lot. And this has actually been shown in randomized controlled trials to have significant benefit in cardiovascular disease, depression, and some pain syndromes. Unfortunately, not quite as much benefit in the flu, but there was one small study that showed decreased incidence of the common cold, which you recall is a coronavirus as well, in about 25 people who were told to do sauna treatments regularly compared to 25 people who didn't. So it's a very small study and a high risk for bias, but there's at least some data suggesting that saunas can be helpful. Again, the application of heat. Uh, I will say here, you've probably heard the idea on the internet that heat kills the virus. 
Well, that's true. Don't do anything crazy here. I've been told about people taking a hair dryer and trying to blow the hair dryer heated air into their mouth and their nose and breathe that air. Don't do that. Um, although it might be true that you might kill a few virus on the very surface of the mucosal cells, remember the virus is actually in the cells of your airways and your body's very effective at thermoregulation. You're not going to raise the temperature in those cells high enough to kill the virus without significantly damaging the cells as well. You'd probably harm yourself, dry out the mucus membrane that you remember from the immune system video is actually the barrier that we've been given to protect us from this virus. So don't do anything extreme. Uh, contrast showers uh, do raise your white blood cell count, probably due to demargination. Uh, there's some data, again, not recent data, but back in the Spanish flu and fomentations. And if you have ability to do a sauna, certainly this could be helpful. These are external uses of water as well. Very interesting. I gave an entire lecture on sleep. I've put some of the tips that I gave for there uh, up on the screen. Lack of sleep decreases almost all aspects of your immune response, both innate and adaptive. All of these cellular uh, mediators are um, not improved. They are, um, they are, it's very detrimental to not get enough sleep. There was at least one randomized controlled trial where those who um, lacked sleep compared to those who got enough sleep when everybody was inoculated with the cold virus, again, remember it's a coronavirus as well, those who lacked sleep were much more likely to become ill. So uh, we know that people need enough sleep to keep their immune health at optimal levels. So one of the things you see at the top of the list here for better sleep is exercise. It's amazing how these things go together. Hot bath is on there as well, right? So avoid bad stuff. Uh, well, duh. You know, we all know that alcohol and caffeine, cigarettes are bad for us, but it makes a lot of sense if you think about it. When there's a respiratory illness going around the community, now would be a great time to quit smoking if you are smoking. Cigarettes are absolutely going to increase your risk of complications from COVID-19. Turns out that alcohol also depresses your immune system, as does caffeine to a slightly lesser extent. So we'll see, this has some implications when we look at some of the herbal remedies that are available for coronavirus. What about de-stressing your life? I liked this study from, from uh, Psychological Medicine. It was published in 2015. I'm going to read you some of the, some of the um, um, abstract from this article. Despite extensive literature assessing associations between religiosity and spirituality and health, Few studies have investigated the clinical applicability of this evidence. In other words, they're saying religion helps. We know that from lots of trials. Maybe we should try it as an intervention. The purpose of this paper was to assess the impact of religious spiritual interventions through randomized clinical trials. Again, you need a randomized clinical trial. So this was a systematic review. They found 23 randomized clinical trials of a religious or spiritual intervention and for all of the things they measured, overall well-being, um, uh, anxiety, uh, et cetera, these interventions were helpful. Their conclusion was, in general, studies have shown that religious and spiritual interventions decrease stress, alcoholism, depression, and on and on. So this is something we talk about at dinner with the doctor uh, quite a lot. I don't, I'm not sure that people who were publishing this at Cambridge University even believe in what they are showing works. But I think there's a reason that things work. And in de-stressing your life, we know that one of the most effective ways to do that is prayer and reading the scriptures. We're just finishing up the Best Way program tomorrow, and those of you who have been to the Best Way program know individuals who want to lose weight are given an assignment. You need to pray three times a day, and you get points for it. You need to read the Bible. Here's some readings that might be helpful for you. Um, this is one of the most effective ways to de-stress. This is one of the most effective ways, I believe, to optimize your health. I do believe we serve a God who loves us and cares for us. And if we do believe that God is in control and God loves us and desires our best good, what a load of stress that can take off your life. I can't um, pass this moment up without an advertisement, of course. 
If you watched our uh, service this um, past Saturday, you saw me advertise some of these things as well. Now that everything's online, it's very easy to go to prayer meeting. You don't even have to leave your, your house. You can lie in your pajamas on your bed and log into prayer meeting. You see the uh, link is there on our website. Uh, we're all doing Zoom meetings now. Uh, we were privileged this last week to lead out in the singing so you can watch my kids play the piano and stuff like that. There's a couple Bible studies going on as well. Uh, it's interesting uh, when Christians look at events like the coronavirus, we remember some of the things that Jesus said would happen at the, uh, at the end of time. And so uh, there's a study looking at that. There's also a week of prayer coming up. Uh, our church has started to memorize again, Psalm 91. If you're a Christian, I encourage you to look at Psalm 91. Even if you're not a Christian, I encourage you to look at Psalm 91 and see what the promises are that God has for us. We're going to be studying that. I think my father-in-law is uh, leading out in some of those studies. Again, these are Zoom meetings. You're welcome to join. So for the last part of this, um, this time together, let's talk about how to evaluate all the information that is coming at us uh, through social media and where we can go for good information. When human beings are scared, we do irrational things. I think that's fairly obvious based on the amount of toilet paper that is on store shelves currently. It turns out that when we're scared, our ability to evaluate evidence rationally decreases. We need to be aware of that bias. We also need to be aware of the human bias to do something, even if doing something is not the right choice at the time. It may be that doing nothing is your better option. But humans have a bias to want to do something. So we need a pill for this. We need a herbal remedy. We need a supplement. We want to do something. We want to add something in response to this new threat that we're facing. Be aware of that bias and evaluate not only the benefits, the potential benefits of any intervention, but also the harm. And that's where a lot of the press that you see on Facebook stops. There's a potential benefit to these new medications for coronavirus. Well, maybe, but there were also some potential harms there that are not frequently reported. So where can we go for good information? Well, our local health department is health.hamiltontennessee.org. That's a great source for good information. They have a link there to cdc.gov. In preparing for this talk, um, I went to scholar.google.com. You can do that too. What you want to look for are randomized controlled trials. And as we'll see, there's lots and lots and lots of those on many of the supplements, remedies, and things that are being recommended currently. It's a little bit easier to go to scholar.google.com than pubmed.gov. It's just easier to search the same articles. There's a lot of misinformation out there. I've already given you the example of Facebook and Twitter. Social media is not a reliable source for information that you should make changes in your health habits based on. The idea that it worked for them and it's going to work for me is a logical fallacy. That's not true. We don't know that. The idea that it can't hurt is also an extremely dangerous way to think. It turns out that many things that we consider fairly benign actually can hurt. Uh, I'll use the example of contrast showers. If you have a heart condition, be very careful, especially if you have heart arrhythmias. You want to be very careful doing things like that. Start very slow. Don't make sudden changes. So what I did for the next two slides here, I just looked at my Facebook feeds. I looked at information that's out there and other videos that I've seen uh, that people are recommending these different things for coronavirus, for either preventing it or getting over the infection, avoiding infecting others, et cetera. And I came up with these, I think there's 16 or 18 there on the screen. We're going to look at all of them and try to think them through rationally. I may not go, I'm, I'm gonna go over these fairly quickly here, I think for sake of time. I originally had one slide, but I had to make it into two slide because there were uh, so many there. Um, I hope you can see my mouse here. The number one thing that I saw that's pretty crazy is bleach. I have no idea why anybody would drink bleach or inhale bleach, but it's been recommended. Don't do that. I think it's fairly obvious to most people that that's a bad idea. The idea for that, however, comes from chlorine dioxide. There's an entire Wikipedia page about miracle mineral supplement, which is essentially a lot of chlorine dioxide. And there's actually randomized controlled trials looking at whether chlorine dioxide is a good thing for humans. 
And it turns out, yes, if you have halitosis, chlorine dioxide mouth rinses can help with your halitosis. But there's lots of harm associated with it. Essentially, you're drinking bleach. Don't do that. There's lots of harms associated with it. Again, there's a Wikipedia page filled with information about chlorine dioxide if you want to look at that. Colloidal silver is another uh, common thing that uh, goes around. It turns out there's lots of randomized controlled trials about colloidal silver. We all know that silver has some uh, antibacterial and antiviral properties, but most of the studies in colloidal silver do not apply to the flu or the cold. You see the three asterisks at the top about whether or not the randomized controlled trial applies in our current setting. Using the most liberal criteria, I said that if a randomized controlled trial had anything to do with a cold or the flu, it had something to say to us today. Obviously, there's very few randomized controlled trials in this very new infection, so we have to extrapolate the data, and probably some of that's fair. Some of it may not be. There was no benefit ever demonstrated for colloidal silver in any setting, so I would not recommend using it. There are definitely harms associated with it. I've seen people recommending inhaling colloidal silver. Don't do that. It's a bad idea. It's not going to help you in any way, shape, or form, and it can cause serious problems. Believe it or not, some people are recommending cocaine, and I don't think I have to say much more about that. We, also, we already talked about the idea of drinking water every 15 minutes. The idea is it's going to wash the virus down your throat into your stomach where your stomach acid will kill it. Uh, don't do that. That's not necessary. If you're dehydrated, yes, you need to drink water, but it turns out if you're drinking too much water, you can actually become hyponatremic, uh, which can be harmful. Uh, it's very unlikely any healthy person is going to be able to kill themselves drinking too much water, but it can happen. Garlic has a lot of press, and I've seen a lot of my friends are taking lots of garlic uh, right now, and there are lots and lots of randomized controlled trials looking at garlic. Um, it turns out garlic is very helpful in randomized controlled trials for blood pressure control, cholesterol control, and diabetes. I found one randomized controlled trial looking at the flu, and it was a horrible study. They used secondary outcomes, which is a way of increasing the chance that you'll find something positive where nothing really exists. There was no change in the frequency at which people got the flu, but those who got the flu perhaps had a little bit fewer symptoms. There was a study looking at colds, and it decreased the frequency of individuals getting colds. Um, but again, the Cochrane collaboration, which is probably the highest level of evidence out there, states that more evidence is needed. We're not really sure if this uh, works. Uh, but again, if you want to eat garlic, it's probably going to help with your social distancing, which is a positive thing. And I love garlic. I eat garlic all the time. Uh, I just am not thinking it's going to help me much with avoiding colds and flus. There are some harms associated with garlic, uh, especially with external use. I don't recommend garlic for poultices. It can cause uh, blistering and burning. Uh, but for internal use, you know, uh, if you want to eat lots of garlic, there's nothing wrong with that. Saltwater gargle. There actually are randomized controlled trials looking at saltwater uh, gargles. And they probably don't apply in our particular case, though. Uh, it was actually done over in Nigeria, was uh, an interesting study that I found on that. Um, the benefit of a saltwater gargle was only after dental procedures. They demonstrated, you know, people healed faster. If you are going to saltwater gargle, please don't aspirate. That could be a bad thing. Uh, and over in South Korea, actually, my father-in-law came up with a, um, a report that a church that was recommending everybody saltwater gargle, they were actually going around squirting the saltwater in people's mouths for them to gargle. That actually spread the coronavirus because they weren't adequately, you know, cleaning the uh, the instrument they were using to spray the salt water in people's mouths. So that was a bad thing. But I don't think that any of us are going to be sharing it. But again, there's probably no benefit to salt water gargling. Um, again, remember the virus is not just on the surface of your mucosal membranes; it's actually in the cells. So things that address that topical area, such as salt water gargling or uh, drinking lots of water, it's not going to really change that much. Vitamin C gets lots of press. Uh, there are lots and lots of randomized controlled trials looking at vitamin C that probably do apply to both colds and flu. Um, colds especially, there's a good uh, Cochrane database um, um, review that looks at all of these randomized controlled trials and probably 
taking uh, vitamin C when you have a cold shortens the duration of symptoms by about a day. Uh, if you look at all the studies, that's the average for, for everybody. So there probably is some benefit there. And there's probably no harm to taking vitamin C, at least in small doses. In large doses, it actually can cause cancer, believe it or not. Uh, that's getting into where people are infusing vitamin C, ironically thinking that they're going to help with cancer, it actually can cause cancer. But the small doses that people take by mouth, uh, it's not a concern. Vitamin D, we've already talked about. There are randomized controlled trials that uh, do look at uh, colds and flus. They might show benefit. It might be that many of us are just deficient in vitamin D and taking vitamin D actually gets us up to the level where we need to be to get our immune health back to where it should be. The results are kind of mixed on that. Uh, there shouldn't be any harm taking recommended doses of, of vitamin D. Um, I will say this is the one supplement on the entire list here that I actually take myself. About once every week or two, I'll take about 50,000 units of uh, vitamin D. Um, it's a fat soluble vitamin, so it lasts in your body for quite some time. What about latex gloves? Well, there's no randomized controlled trials, but you've probably seen people walking around with latex gloves. Typically, they'll touch things with the gloves and then they'll touch their face or their mask and that kind of defeats the whole purpose of the latex gloves. There's probably no harm to them, but they're not probably going to benefit you in the slightest. Just wash your hands. Zinc has gotten lots of press recently. There are lots of randomized controlled trials looking at zinc that might apply in the current setting. These uh, studies uh, suggest that it shortens symptoms of a common cold, but it doesn't actually prevent the common cold. Yes, zinc is toxic to viruses, but no, taking zinc lozenges is not going to prevent you from getting a viral infection or uh, a cold. This has actually been studied and it doesn't work that way, but it will shorten the duration of symptoms by a little bit, um, by about one day again. I will say that many folks might be, if they're not eating a healthy diet, they might be deficient in zinc and certainly zinc deficiency can cause immunosuppression. But on the other hand, taking too much zinc can actually depress your immune system as well. You can become toxic by taking too much zinc. I get my zinc in my diet. I'm not worried at all that I'm deficient. Pumpkin seeds have a lot. I think sesame seeds have a lot. There's, you can look up which foods have a lot of zinc. Eat those foods you'll be healthier, make sure you're not zinc deficient, but I personally am not recommending lozenges to anybody. I will say one more thing, I've heard people who figured out that, well, the lozenge covers my throat, but my nasal passages could still get it. I think I'll squirt some zinc up there. Don't do that. It can cause you to lose your sense of smell. No, just, just don't do that permanently. Don't squirt zinc up your nose, don't inhale zinc. Um, if you wanna take zinc lozenges, do it for only a few days. Uh, green tea, actually, there's lots of randomized controlled trials. They probably do apply that's been tested in colds and flus and a whole different variety of capsules. Believe it or not, there's studies of people gargling green tea, which I'm not sure why you would want to do that. And there might be some benefits to uh, all of these. The results are fairly mixed. All the studies are very small, which means there's a high risk of bias there. But all the studies did uh, tend to show some sort of benefit. Um, it might be hepatotoxic, but likely at doses that any of us might be taking, it's not a concern. I will remind you, however, that most green tea actually has caffeine in it, which we already talked about is immunosuppressive. So I wouldn't, I'm not personally taking green tea. Echinacea, another common uh, herbal supplement, lots and lots of randomized controlled trials in colds and flus. There was no benefit. So uh, don't bother with echinacea. There's probably no harm. It smells good if you use it externally, but there's no benefit at all. N-acetylcysteine was something that I was reminded of uh, during this uh, cold and flu season. Um, it is a common medication that is used in the hospital, and we know that it helps people break up uh, the uh, mucus that they might collect down in their lungs. That's not why we use it in the hospital generally, but that is a benefit of it. There's one randomized controlled trial, if I recall correctly, it's about 1997. It's a large trial, it was very well done. And it did demonstrate that those individuals who were in the N-acetylcysteine group had a probably about a 60 to 75% reduction in the symptoms from influenza. It did not prevent them from getting influenza. It simply decreased their symptoms. I'm not sure what to say about that, except to point out that if we have some people who are taking N-acetylcysteine 
who decrease their symptoms and now don't know that they actually have the virus, they're still spreading the virus around the community. For that reason, I'm not personally recommending N-acetylcysteine, but I can see why individuals might want to take it if it makes your uh, illness that much better. I will also say that in the study, you had to take N-acetylcysteine for six months through the entire flu season before the flu was around. So I'm not sure that that applies to the current setting where you might try to run down to the drugstore, buy some NAC and start taking it now or when you start to have symptoms. I don't know that that works. In addition, there's at least some animal models showing that N-acetylcysteine, if you're taking it for six months at those doses, uh, it can be tumorigenic. Ironically, it causes lung cancer um, in a, I think it was a mouse model. So I'm not personally taking N-acetylcysteine. I don't recommend it to others. I also am not doing nasal rinses, but it turns out lots of people are. There's lots of randomized controlled trials in cold and flu, and this does benefit people with their symptoms. I can't even imagine squirting some uh, saline up my, uh, up my nose, but uh, whether saline or water, uh, this can benefit people's symptoms with cold and flu. And it turns out the harm was in general fairly mild and rare, but you can, again, you can aspirate. And um, I'm not personally gonna be doing um, nasal rinses, but there are lots of randomized controlled trials suggesting benefit for symptoms. Uh, not prevention, but symptoms. I added elderberries uh, today uh, because I was reminded lots of people like elderberry extract. And uh, there is at least two or three randomized controlled trials looking at elderberries and influenza. It probably does apply. And it did demonstrate decreased symptoms and shortened symptoms. Um, I will point out, you always want to know who funds the study. This not only applies to medications, if a drug manufacturer is funding a study that then shows their medication shows benefit, well, you need to disclose that at least and perhaps have some independent verification. It turns out the randomized controlled trials for elderberry are funded by, you guessed it, the people who make elderberry extract. So I'm not sure how to um, interpret that. Um, raw elderberries or actually eating the elderberries tends to cause nausea and vomiting. That's why most people use the extract. The uh, only side effects seem to be weakness, dizziness, numbness, and stupor. Um, so again, there are, there's some demonstration of benefit. If you believe a study that's been funded by the manufacturer, uh, I'm not personally taking elderberry, but there is some suggestion of benefit there. The last one is iodine. I had never even heard of using iodine for anything except cleansing the skin. I do that in the operating room every day. There are no randomized controlled trials, but there's uh, at least um, one video that's going around suggesting that we need to be using iodine in a variety of ways, whether taking by mouth um, or even inhaling iodine, whether nasally or by mouth. Don't do that. There's no data suggesting it works. The one study that's cited in the video is produced by one scientist who has a vested interest in iodine. It's never been suggested to be helpful in any other settings. There's no randomized controlled data. It's in general a bad idea to try inhaling things uh, with the idea that it's going to somehow help the virus. It's, it's not going to work. The virus is already in the cells underneath the mucosal membrane, the mucosa and the, um, the mucus is there in a layer to protect you. Don't do things that might mess up that mucus layer. I also wanna point out that natural is not necessarily safe. This is a study looking at a bunch of traditional Chinese medicines that are being taken right now. Um, they're selling out, in fact. You've probably seen news articles that uh, people can't keep these herbs on hand fast enough. Um, but looking at these, they're not really safe. 26 of them were taken from um, a variety of different uh, herbal suppliers and they sequenced the DNA within them. They looked at other things that might be in there, especially heavy metals and other medications. And you see the results on the screen. 92% of these traditional herbal medicines were found to have some sort of contamination. For example, in the non-compliant uh, for DNA, Many of them had animal products that were not disclosed on the label. Um, they mentioned snow leopard because that's an endangered species, but there's many others, uh, both plants and animals that were not disclosed on the label. 50% of them actually had medications in them that were not disclosed, even warfarin, which is a blood thinner, dexamethasone, which is a, a steroid, diclofenac, which is a very potent uh, NSAID, 
which of course we don't recommend NSAIDs right now while, while the coronavirus is going around if you can avoid it. Ciproheptadine, which is a very potent um, antihistamine, the, and paracetamol, which is Tylenol. These are going to affect the way people feel after taking these herbal supplements. And it's not has nothing to do with the supplement. It's because it's been laced with medications. It's not pure. And many of them had increased amounts of heavy metal, especially uh, lead, cadmium, and one had an arsenic level greater than 10 times safe levels. So just because it's uh, a natural or it's herbal or it's you know been mixed up in an herb store does not mean it's safe. These are not regulated by the FDA. You don't really know what you're getting. I've always thought if we could somehow just... So here's a final video. Um, thought I had a slide before this, but I think this video kind of wraps it up nicely and reminds us of some of the things that we've learned. Uh, I like Mark Rober. He makes uh, good videos. I've always thought if we could somehow just see the germs around us, everyone would be a lot more careful and we'd get sick way less. Unfortunately, that's still not possible. So I did the next best thing by running a day long experiment in this third grade classroom. I found this powder called glow germ and just like real germs, when it's on your hands, you can't see it. But unlike real germs, if you turn a black light on, it becomes visible, but it transfers to things you've touched. So it provides a really good way to visualize exactly how germs spread. So before the kids arrived as a control I went around and noted any pre-existing spots in the room that fluoresced under the black light and then it was go time. The kids of course had no idea what we were doing and that the teacher had been secretly infected with the glowing powder. So she randomly shook the hands of three kids but didn't touch any of the rest. And so with that, they just went about their normal day. At break, I did choose one random student and he agreed to let me put some of the powder on his hands too. And then two hours later at lunchtime, I checked the results. Remember, everything you see here started with just the teacher and one student having a little of that powder on their hands. And because my flashlight can only illuminate one spot at a time, I used Photoshop to better visualize our observations of where germs were left behind, including on the other kids. Uh-oh, we're pretty hot over here. Oh, right here. And they were actually pretty diligent about washing their hands. This was the desk of the kid that was infected. And what's crazy is that germs could live on a hard surface like this for up to nine days. And so you can see how important it is to disinfect the things a sick person regularly touches. For example, this was the phone of the teacher in the experiment. Even if you wash your hands really often, if you immediately pull out your phone, a lot of those germs just go right back on your hands. Think about when the last time was that you cleaned your phone. My friend Joanne at the Wall Street Journal recently demonstrated you can clean your phone with an antibacterial wipe every day for at least a year and it doesn't affect the oleophobic coating at all. And this hopefully gives you a better mental model of why it's really important to wash your hands or use hand sanitizer after being at places like this or this or this, or this. Cleaning commonly touched surfaces is important because even if a virus is spread through airborne transmission, those tiny droplets don't stay in the air for long. Then they land on surfaces waiting to be touched by our hands. Which raises an important point. The ultimate defense against catching a virus is just don't touch your face. Your eyes, nose, and mouth are like the single weak spot on the Death Star when it comes to viruses. That's the only way they can get in to infect you. But as you can see here, not touching your face is easier said than done. And before you think, yeah, well that's just kids for you, this was what the teacher's face looked like at the end of the day, and she said she tried extra hard to remember not to touch her face. I found this result fascinating, so I put the powder on my own hands for a few hours, and I resisted the urge to touch my face so many times that I fully expected I was going to have a perfectly clean face and the moral high ground. And then this is what I saw. <laughs> What the heck? I genuinely have no idea when any of this came on. Until I reviewed the footage. Oh, well, there you go. On average, we touch our face 16 times an hour, which is why washing hands is so important. It's impossible to catch a virus directly through your hands. It's as futile as shooting the outer surface of the Death Star. The problem is we use our hands to help the virus out by constantly giving it a ride to our figurative Death Star exhaust ports. <laughs> Because of this, I ran another experiment with some of the kids after lunch. First, I had them put some lotion on their hands that also glows under a black light. But then I told them I made a mistake and used the wrong lotion. Can you guys just wash, go wash your hands real quick. 
I do a good washing, right? Yeah, do the right washing, okay? I just tricked you guys again. Because what I really wanted to do is test how good you are at washing your hands. So guess what I'm gonna do now? Show me your hands. But before I show you how effective they actually were at washing their hands, here's what you should quickly know about viruses. They are super tiny, but also the most abundant biological entity on the planet. In fact, there's over 10 million viruses in any single drop of seawater. And a lot of types of viruses are beneficial to the planet's ecosystem, and only an insanely tiny percentage affect humans at all. And they're really simple. Viruses are basically a shell with some DNA inside, and they just want to spread and duplicate. That's their only goal. But they're so simple simple that they need a host to do that. So they reproduce by infecting their host cells and then trick them to become factories that just make more exact copies of the virus. When you get sick and then cough or sneeze or wipe your nose and then touch a surface, you're putting copies of this virus out to find other hosts and just repeat the process. And so here's what the kids hands look like after washing their hands. Uh oh, look at the backs. Let me see your fingernails. Oh, look at all those germs. Oh, your thumb. Oh, my hand. Oh, look at your wrist. Look at your wrist. We all sort of have a habitual way of washing our hands. So once again, I tried this myself using the typical quick way I do it in my muscle memory. Granted, that's better than nothing, but you can see the difference compared to when I was deliberate and took 20 seconds, which is why it helps to do things like sing the happy birthday song twice, or you could do what I do and follow Brandon Flowers' example. Jealousy turning saints in eager eyes Cause I'm Mr. Brightside and then for a final experiment, I wanted to show how dumb handshaking is, so I infected the first kid with the powder and then had them do a handshake chain down the line. The fifth person here still had significant traces on their hand, so I put him at the first and lined four more kids up after him, and three of their hands glowed. So we got trace germs from the original person all the way down eight handshakes later. So if you ever meet me in real life, please don't be offended if in lieu of a handshake, I offer you a fist bump and a selfie. In conclusion, what does this all mean with regards to the coronavirus COVID-19. You should be concerned to take this seriously, but regardless of what you see in the coming weeks, there's absolutely no need to panic. As I'm sure you've heard a bunch by now, our goal is to flatten the curve so that the reported cases stay just under the capacity of the healthcare system. And social distancing is the best knob that we can turn to affect that. The reason this helps should hopefully make more sense after watching this video, especially for those who have been doubting the science and feeling like this is an extreme reaction. And my take here is I'm a practical optimist. The upside is while this virus is bad, it could be way worse. And this gives us a chance as a global community to get some systems and methods in place to handle something potentially even more drastic in the future. Also, maybe it will lead to changing some social norms, like replacing handshakes with fist bumps, or when people are really sick, thinking it's okay to mingle about and go to work. Globally, the normal flu kills anywhere from a quarter to a half a million people a year, due in large part to people not practicing good germ hygiene. So if this experience makes people more socially aware of the right precautions to take when they get sick that will save countless lives for years to come long after this coronavirus is old news. And make no mistake, this is going to be rough for some more than others, but history has shown that us humans are pretty resilient. These types of things can bring out the worst in us, but they can also bring out the best, most wholesome parts of us, like these Italians practicing their social distancing with an impromptu balcony concert. How we feel about the situation is largely dependent on just which part we choose to focus on. For me, that means being grateful to the heroes in our healthcare system, or the school lunch ladies still providing free lunch for kids who depend on them, or the scientists all over the world who are working tirelessly seven days a week to create better testing methods and a vaccine. This is going to be a bumpy ride for us, but the economy will eventually bounce back as it always does, and we'll be better off as a global community for having gone through this. Again, take this seriously, but there's absolutely no need to panic. I thought that was a um, fairly balanced message. I'll share with you some of the information I got just this afternoon from a former resident of mine who's now a fellow up at uh, up in New York City. He's doing a colorectal residency or colorectal fellowship after his general surgery residency, but he is being repurposed as an emergency room physician and he says, you guys are behind us, but need to learn from our mistakes. We already have 15 residents out in my program alone. There were many more patients and exposures than we knew. New York had like 200 known cases a week ago, and now we have 16,000. And he shares um, a letter sent from his hospital administrator that they're estimating 
uh, over the next 22 to 32 days, they will need 700 to 934 ICU beds in their hospital system alone. That lower estimate exceeds their ICU capacity, even constructing new ICU beds and turning every single operating room into an ICU. Um, so certainly this is affecting New York City right now in a big way. Uh, I'm hopeful that here in Chattanooga, we have, um, we've, um, averted some of that. I think here we have a smaller city, a smaller town. Perhaps we practice social distancing better than New Yorkers. I don't know. Um, certainly there's some benefits to country living, if you will. I'm thankful that I'm, uh, I'm out in the country here, a little bit more fresh air, more sunshine perhaps. Um, but each one of us need to be praying for our healthcare workers, praying for those who are sick. We have individuals right now in the ICU on at least two out of three hospital systems here in town and it will be an interesting next few days. With that being said, I'm not sure how many people are on the call here. I'm not able to see that, but I'm happy to take some, uh, some questions and answers. I'm not sure if Doug or John, we're going to uh, compile some of those off our texting. If you uh, want to text some questions in now, we can have a little bit of interaction here, and uh, hopefully we can do that. I'm probably going to take the screen down here so I can see some of you and what's going on. So I'll point out before we do that, uh, dwtdhickson at gmail.com uh, is available for questions that you want to email me or if you want to sign up for the monthly reminders for our programs. Um, happy to do that. And then uh, dwtdhickson.com has some excellent immune boosting uh, recipes there. I thank my wife for uh, putting that up. So with that, I'm going to uh, escape from this slide program and I'm going to uh, probably uh, stop sharing and now I'm coming back into seeing you all. Um, Doug, I don't know if you or Chris have uh, had a chance to compile some of this. Looks like we have 27 chats here and I'm happy to happy to um, try to scroll through them. Are you wanting me just to scroll through all of them? Okay, I'm going down. All right, these are all just the um, stuff looks like megan and cody are here hi hi hello everyone hello everyone hopefully i fixed the uh sound uh the volume on the videos okay what about nasal rinses um i think i mentioned those in the in the talk there's nothing wrong if you want to do some nasal rinses it does decrease symptoms of the cold and the flu a little bit there's randomized controlled trials showing that uh, i would strongly discourage putting zinc up your nose or iodine up your nose or anything else up your nose. And please be careful not to aspirate. Um, yeah, RCT, thank you, Pastor Chris, for um, sharing. That means randomized controlled trial. When you're thinking about whether something works or not, it turns out if you don't have a randomized controlled trial, you don't know if it works because human bias is so strong. The placebo effect is a pretty impressive thing that we need to understand. Um, uh, Megan suggests that we need to watch the Stop It video. Um, that's a great idea. Maybe I'll show that if people are still on the call here when we're done. How much N-acetylcysteine per day? I have no idea. I don't recommend it. I don't think people should take it, and therefore I haven't bothered to look up the dose. <clears throat> Excuse me. I assume that you can find other people who do recommend it, and they'll tell you how much you ought to take. Again, if you take high doses for long periods of time, it uh, causes cancer. So at least in animal models. So I don't recommend it. Um, it does have medical uses that are appropriate in Tylenol overdose, for instance, or if someone needs a CT scan and they're at high risk for contrast uh, uh, injury. And acetylcysteine has specific medical uses, but I would not recommend taking it daily. You mentioned not recommending NSAIDs, assuming Tylenol and acetaminophen. Why is this? There is suggestive data that uh, NSAIDs in COVID um, cause a slight increase or slight worsening of outcomes. I don't know how solid that data is, but NSAIDs have a lot of complications. And if you cannot take them, it's definitely in your best interest. NSAIDs cause stomach ulcers, um, cause gastritis, um, and if they're, they're not good long-term medications, they're appropriate for short-term indications. But if you have COVID-19, if I had COVID-19 and I had a fever that I wanted to bring down because it was extremely high, I would probably take a little bit of Tylenol. 
Um, I would not do um, aspirin or Advil or uh, ibuprofen, uh, diclofenac, things of that nature. Um, again, that's early suggestive data. It's not particularly solid, but it, um, I don't recommend in general, I try to get away from medications. Uh, let's talk about the fever response for a moment. There's no need to bring down the fever unless it's very high. The fever response is part of your body's attempt to fight it off. It's increasing your metabolic rate and it's actually uh, fairly healthy. We don't recommend people try to bring down their fevers unless they're going extremely high. Uh, earlier, you mentioned asymptomatic carriers spreading COVID. Can you touch on that a little more? Is there random testing or something? Uh, this is data from, uh, from China, is my understanding. Um, we don't think that this is the big way that uh, the COVID virus spreads. Most of it is from symptomatic carriers, but it is known that folks who either have not yet shown symptoms or even more rarely folks that will never show symptoms can shed the virus in their secretions in enough quantity to infect other people. And so um, it probably is true that some people before they show symptoms or in more rare cases, folks that will never show symptoms actually can infect other people. Um, there was one, um, I think this was shown in, um, I forget which country. There was a country that really clamped down and they found 15 people that had COVID. They isolated them all and they thought they'd taken care of it, but there was one person that didn't have symptoms that they didn't catch. And that person happened to infect a lot of people because of um, being in contact with a lot of people. Um, let's see. Can we get this video informed to share? I assume that's possible. I assume someone's uh, recording it. I don't know. What about wearing, not wearing masks? That's an excellent question, um, Doug. And I don't know that I can share this screen. This is an association, not a proven causation, but in that same text message from uh, Dr. Hyde, who's up in New York City right now, they're requiring every single person in the hospital to wear a mask 100% of the time, despite the fact that masks are in very short supply. And there's an association with doing that and decreased touching of one's face. And that's probably the benefit. We know that these masks are not prevent, they're not um, N95 masks, these are just general masks that if you happen to cough unexpectedly and you didn't have a chance to cover, it would prevent it from spraying quite as widely. And it would also keep you from touching your face after you've been in contact uh, with others. Um, Joni asked about website for attending Zoom Bible study and prayer meeting. The website is southbaysda.org, southbaysda.org. And there's links down at the bottom um, for all those different uh, things. Are the videos available online? Uh, let's see. Yes, all those videos I took straight off of, um, straight off of uh, YouTube. And um, wonderful session. Please ex define extremely high fever. I'd have to defer to my wife. If it were me, uh, it has something to do with comfort level. If my fever gets over 102, 103, I'm so uncomfortable that I'm probably gonna take some Tylenol. Um, I'm not going to try to take so much Tylenol that I got my temperature back to normal. Um, but if certainly if someone's temperature is over 104, they should definitely be thinking about doing things to bring that down. Uh, appreciate some folks putting up the um, website there, southbaysda.org. Another question here. Earlier you mentioned asymptomatic carriers spreading COVID. Okay, I think that's um, a, just a question that was from earlier. I appreciate you all uh, having some patience with us as we got this going. Happy to answer any more questions if anything uh, comes up here. Anyone have any more questions that um, you would like to ask here? Well, hearing none, um, Pastor Chris, if you want to unmute yourself there, and uh, go ahead and have a closing prayer for us here. Um, you can't unmute yourself. Let's see if I can unmute you. Um, where's Chris Anderson? I'm gonna unmute you. How about that? That okay, works? Unmuted. Well, thanks for that presentation. It was very interesting. I'm glad we squeezed dinner with a doctor in this week. It was really helpful. And I'm sure I, uh, others here appreciate it just as much as I did. 
Let's close with a word of prayer and thank God for his goodness and ask for his continued guidance and protection. Father in heaven, we are grateful that we are not alone on this little planet, but we have you that is with us in good times and bad. You promised that this world is not all there is, that you have a better place for us. And this gives us hope. Lord, I just pray that you'll be with each person that is, and family that's represented here, that you'll be with them. May this information be a benefit to their life. Keep us all safe as we seek to um, carry out these principles in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just a reminder, southbsd.org, if you have uh, specific questions, you can email dwtdhickson at gmail.com, and you can visit the website dwtdhickson.com for lots of excellent immune-boosting recipes. Thank you all for your time.